Trisha L. Gleason, Assistant City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call the special session of the City Council to be held on Monday, September 18th. I'm sorry, that's not today. Um, on Monday, October 2nd at 5.15 p.m. in the Historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting a work session on the Smart Parking and Mobility Management Plan. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for October 2nd, 2023. As a reminder to viewers and listeners, due to the nature of tonight's meeting topic, public input is not accepted. However, you may contact the City Council directly from the City's website at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts. Attendees tonight are Mayor Cavanaugh. Here. Council members Farber. Here. Jones. Here. Via phone. Resnick here. Roussel here. Sprank here. Wethel here. City Manager Van Milligan here. City Attorney Brumwell here. Our work session will begin its Smart Parking and Mobility Management Plan update. All right, Steve, I see you're ready to go. We'll turn it over to you. All right. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Steve Sampson Brown, Project Manager with the Engineering Department. Here to speak with you all tonight about the mobility side of our smart parking and mobility management plan. I'd like to remind everyone, even if you prefer to drive a car everywhere, once you get out of your car, you become a pedestrian and mobility affects you. So along with many of us and other forms of that. So uh, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge what you're about to see tonight. Uh, again, I've, a lot of work's gone into it behind the scenes, uh, especially city staff, engineering, planning, sustainability health, uh, several departments uh, provided, have been working for months to get this uh, information to where it's at tonight, so I want to acknowledge their effort uh, uh, as we continue to move forward. Uh, so again, just a quick agenda for this evening. Uh, briefly touch on the project background, how did we get here tonight? Uh, we'll be talking about why mobility matters to Dubuqueers and uh, we'll be talking about uh, mobility standards and then finally we'll wrap up with next steps. Uh, here with me tonight uh, with the RDG Planning and Design Group is Ryan Peterson and Marty Schuchert. They'll be talking in a moment to you about the details of the mobility plan and update. Uh, if I could just touch back on the background. So we started uh, with our RFP about a year ago or so. Uh, the focus area is the area in red primary focus area, heart of what I generally consider downtown, although there's no specific boundaries. Or, uh, and then the green areas, we acknowledge that people move from the core of our downtown to places like Mercy Hospital, uh, University Hospital, Senior High, uh, things on top of the bluff, if you want. So that's uh, generally how we came up with this uh, uh, map to focus on and then of course on the right hand side is the core of what I would consider our urban downtown uh, really a lot of businesses things like that a flatter area of downtown so uh, just an additional area of focus for some of these uh, aspects of mobility uh, so the RFP uh, started with two sides of that smart parking and mobility management plan focus on parking, uh, current condition analysis. We were just here a few weeks ago providing an update on that, modeling, and then we're working towards a uh, finalization of the plan. Uh, next phase on the parking side will be the uh, design and pro uh, technology procurement, which should be happening shortly here. Project outcomes, again, why are we going through this? So on the parking side, uh, looking for operations and management, policy recommendations, work plan, revenue model, technology recommendations, and of course, implementing the app action plan, which will make parking in our downtown area a lot easier for all parking users. On the mobility side, we're, t we're talking uh, in themes, not in specific details like the parking outcomes are. Uh, some more concepts, uh, things to uh, dig into uh, future uh, for staff to do that. Uh, considering policy and uh, planning updates, you know, can't, are you carrying currently ride a bike on a city sidewalk? Some people like that, we've heard. Uh, some people don't, so those types of policies, how can we modernize those? Uh, E-scooters, things like that are starting to happen. You see them around town, so uh, just new, new ways of using the downtown, and we wanna make sure that we're up to speed with our policies to uh, make sure it's safe for everyone. And then improving safety, comfort, convenience, connectedness of transit, bicycling, walking, and rolling. 
So one of the things uh, we did about a year ago, it was a lot colder than it was today, uh, we took a, a group ride around downtown. Again, as a user, to me, just you got to be out there on the street. You got to use it. If you're a bicyclist, you can't uh, assess a bike lane or, or a bike uh, route in a car. It just doesn't work the same, doesn't feel the same as traffic's whizzing by you a two, few feet away at 35 miles an hour or whatever it might be. So, um, and mobility is just the ease of moving around. So high level definition, transportation is the act of moving something from one place. So little nuance there, but uh, we use the term mobility. That is the national uh, conversation about ease of getting from place to place uh, using a form of transportation that everyone uh, personally chooses to use. And I'll turn it over to Ryan. All right, uh, well, thank you, Steve. Um, we're gonna go through a few slides here and, and summarize the stakeholder input that's been received to date. Um, you have seen these themes uh, this past January, but uh, that stakeholder input and the work that we've done this past spring and this summer um, has got us here, so I thought it would be uh, worthwhile just a quick refresh. So uh, first and foremost, uh, the respondents that we spoke to spoke very highly of the Juul system and how it's run, um, but there was feedback to suggest that it could be better used specifically as we look to move people from the east to west uh, throughout the city to connect jobs and services. Um, and, I, and, and the city is working on that. Secondly, uh, pedestrian-centric connectivity could be approved upon, um, and this is thinking higher level, um, getting from district to district. So if you're going from Schmidt Island to the Millwork District. How do you get there by foot or by bike? Uh, so we're looking at those connections, that's just one example. Lighting, uh, there was a lot of discussion about lighting, both within um, the perspective of both from a vehicular standpoint, we heard feedback about alleys, and also most importantly, uh, pedestrian. Uh, and then how lighting impacts safety. So there was a theme about that, and so you'll see later on in this discussion, or this presentation, uh, that we've started to outline some potential standards that could be employed. Uh, consistent, uniform wayfinding signage. Uh, there was a fair amount of discussion about that, um, whether it's for cars or people on uh, their bike or by foot. Um, moving around the community, uh, you have a signage system um, already, uh, but there was, uh, uh, people spoke uh, to the potential to update that to um, employ uh, one example would be if you're walking somewhere to put on the sign, it's a five minute walk versus a three block walk or something like that. Something that most folks can relate to. Um, that's just one example you'll see here later on. Uh, we talked quite a bit with the respondents about um, bike lanes, um, bike amenities on street. Uh, we did the, the tour uh, that Steve showed you a picture of. There was another tour done by the sustainability department. We've spent some time today and, and will again tomorrow on bikes. Um, but there is a consistent theme that the city could benefit from it, but then there was also this concern about speed and how fast uh, vehicles were moving. And um, we experienced that today. I think uh, there was a, there's a number of beautiful routes, but there's, there's opportunities there. And then when it came to safety, um, uh, most men that we interviewed felt uh, safe. Uh, some women uh, expressed concerns. and so. Uh, that gets back to lighting, it gets back to some of the standards we have for alleys and things like that, uh, the blue light phones, and so you'll see within this presentation that we've um, started to address those uh, themes. So uh, one more thing, uh, Steve um, and the city uh, put together a bike lane pilot project uh, within the Millwork District, and then there was some public engagement around that. Um, right now there's been some discussions around 9th and 10th Street, uh, 11th Street, um, and uh, I think the word is still out as to which uh, may be a good candidate uh, for a potential pilot. Again, we're, we're very early on here, so I don't want to uh, suggest that anything has been decided by any means. So that's something that the city and our team will continue to evaluate. Uh, one more thing from a stakeholder engagement. Um, we did have a public input survey uh, that was uh, provided. We had about at the time when we pulled the results, you're about to see 823 people. Um, and so the last time, do we lose audio? The last time that we um, went through this, um, uh, we focused on, on the parking side of things. 
Um, so tonight I'll kind of hone in on some of the, the survey input that relates to more of the mobility side of things. So you can see here in the upper left corner of the screen the breakdown of our uh, uh, respondents by way of um, how much they earn. Um, you can see the age range here. Uh, so I guess the predominant number of individuals uh, earned between $100,000 and $149,000 per year was the highest responding category, followed by more than that. And then uh, it was pretty consistent here um, between those that earned $25,000 up to about $100,000. So, um, and then on the right-hand side, you can see, um, generally speaking, um, it, it follows uh, pretty closely to Dubuque's uh, demographic um, breakdown um, with uh, the number of respondents in the uh, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, um, 45 to 54, and how that uh, shakes out. And then we had more females than males, um, and then you can see predominantly um, uh, white uh, from a race standpoint. Um, however, if you, we do have uh, what we believe to be a, a representation cross-section of the community. Um, we also asked individuals what part of town they live in, uh, whether it's the West End um, was the, the highest category, 200 and so uh, respondents answered from that perspective where they live. Rural Dubuque was following that, and then the College Grandview area, the South End, Eagle Point District. So uh, these are individuals that live within um, the city uh, in terms of potentially below the bluff uh, for where those districts are. Um, we also asked where they work. Uh, so where are people going? So where do they live and then where do they go and how do they get there? Uh, you can see here in the, in the bold text, uh, most people live above the bluff and commute downtown uh, for work. Uh, additional questions that we asked is how far people are willing to walk uh, from where they park their vehicle to where you work. Um, most people responded one to two blocks or two to three minutes uh, was what they would prefer. Uh, that's how far they're willing. Um, you can also see here how far are you willing to walk from your vehicle to your work for non-work, so entertainment, uh, recreation, leisure. You can see that threshold picks up um, a few more blocks with most people um, you know, in that one to two or three to four block range. More than half of the respondents uh, you can see there. <coughs> So if you're coming downtown, you have a higher threshold for how far you're willing to walk to goods and services uh, if it's for leisure. Uh, a few other things that we asked about, what are barriers that might discourage you from walking further? So uh, lighting was a concern, um, and I'm honing in on this, these four items here in the, in the red box because uh, we can't control the weather. Um, safety is being dressed by the police force um, and, and is not necessarily a physical thing that we can um, design or create or plan around. Uh, we can help improve that through the uh, public planning, uh, but it's not uh, a focus in terms of, you know, what does the street look like. I prefer to park as close as I can. Um, that was, uh, that, that is a tendency that some people may have uh, regardless of whether or not they're willing to walk. So that's why we focus in on these four here. So lighting, speed, uh, we can address speed through physical improvements to the street. Uh, sidewalks and connectivity, uh, the, the community has uh, done a great job of continuing to move that forward, those initiatives. Um, and then crosswalks or uh, concern about crossing the street due to um, other physical limitations. And then you can see here as we move on down a, a number of other barriers. Uh, but these ones here we, th we felt pretty strongly that we could have an impact on uh, through these standards that we are uh, going to share with you here in a moment. Few additional um, um, questions that we asked. Uh, I guess the majority of the people uh, would not be willing to use a different form of transportation for work, um, and so predominantly a commuting community as of right now. Uh, but uh, the good news is, and, and, I, and not that that's bad news, but I would say that uh, bicycling, public transit, and walking, folks are very interested in. Um, especially when it comes time to uh, the recreational side of things or um, outside of your professional work environment. Um, would you consider using a mode of transportation other than your personal vehicle? I just, I just said that, yes. Uh, we, more than half of the people there would be willing to use a different form of transportation. Um, and then predominantly walking was number one, public transit, cycling, and then ride share, um, which is, would be like a Uber or taxi. Uh, scooter and, and longboarding are, are down the list, but uh, certainly did receive uh, a number of um, votes. 
And then last, uh, lastly, what barriers or reasons discourage you from using an alternative mode of transportation? You can see time uh, was the number one element that people um, responded with. Um, secondly, transit, we talked about that earlier as a theme that we heard from individuals. Um, needing their vehicle throughout the day, uh, weather, um, and so forth. Uh, those were all key things that um, we took into consideration to help guide uh, the development of the standards that uh, we'll talk about here in a moment. Steve, you want to talk about um, why it's important? So I think one of the things is mobility uh, as a form of transportation, sometimes it's focused on in certain cities, but to me it's, it's, it, it's interwoven into the fabric of our community. And I was going through our uh, vision statement that you all put together, and I just highlighted a few of the things that mobility influences within our community, and, and there's more than one word highlighted. So I think it's important to, to step back and think about the big picture and how mobility impacts that big picture over time, either good mobility or, or bad mobility. And, you know, if you're middle class, upper middle class, you, you have a choice. You likely can drive a car and most likely do own a car. But there's others in our community that rely on good mobility to get around. It's just not as easy if you're not as mobile. And one of the things, I'm a biker and I've been biking the B Branch corridor. And to me, there's talk about comfort so people are comfortable. You see a many amazing things in our community out there and a lot of people using it in different ways. And I think that B Branch shows when done right, connectiveness and comfort, people do come out and people do use mobility in different ways than besides driving everywhere. So uh, great thing. Within our own um, uh, poverty reduction plan, we understand that one of the determinants of poverty is transportation. Good mobility can provide alternative tra uh, forms of transportation that doesn't require uh, car ownership. And then as I've started working on the smart parking mobility plan, I've really taken a different lens as a civil engineer. I used to drive a lot of places in Dubuque and I would look around at things and mostly the streets and th signs. But really, I, in the last year, I've really been looking as I've been out and about, how are people using our downtown? Uh, this person was coming out of Eagles uh, an hour after it stopped snowing at 10 o'clock at night, uh, picking up groceries. To me, that person probably isn't choosing to ride a bike in a snowstorm to pick up groceries. They're relying on a bike. And that good mobility and connectivity can, can in help enhance those trips that people are making in downtown. Uh, this person I happened to see driving to work one day, uh, went back on a public safety camera. So, it was minus three degrees at 8 a.m. that day in February, and it was a minus nine wind chill. That person, and there was actually a couple people waiting for the bus. Probably wouldn't be a good day to drive a car if you could uh, have that as an option. So uh, this person, uh, same thing, walking home several blocks uh, up Romberg Avenue to their house uh, after uh, shopping at Walgreens at 10 o'clock at night. So we talk about safety and lighting. People are out using our downtown uh, in different ways than just jumping in a car and driving to Walmart on the west side of town. And they rely on uh, good aspects of mobility. Uh, this person was interesting, so it's hard to see, but they're actually getting on a city bus with two 40-gallon uh, trash cans, trash bags full of returnable cans. And they're using the city bus to return cans to, I'm guessing, West Locust or someplace. And you might think, well, gee, Steve, you know, that's a great photo, but that doesn't happen very often. I literally walked out of City Hall last week and saw someone getting on a bus in front of City Hall with a bag of trash cans. So again, people are just using our, off, our opportunities for mobility in different ways that we might not always think of. And it's an important part of equity and inclusion. And of course, we just talk about lighting. Lighting was one of the big conversations with our stakeholders and people use downtown at all times of the day and night in different places. And some places, are the B Branch Greenway is a very well lit corridor. Other parts of our downtown, not so well lit. This is uh, at dusk coming out of City Hall and I just happened to see this group of bike riders. And again, could they benefit with a little bit uh, improved lighting on the street? Probably would increase their comfort. Uh, this group, I was Saturday morning, 32nd Street up by the old Flex Steel site and you know the famous sidewalk to nowhere. A uh, group of teenagers walking a few dogs or a dog uh, heading off to Heritage Trail. We don't have a sidewalk connection from Central and White Street past, starting at Jackson that goes all the way 
to the Heritage Trail, which is a great uh, uh, feature for outdoor recreation, entertainment, and mobility. So one of the things I started to think about too is mobility is uh, things to keep in mind. So Dubuque, downtown streets were laid out in the 1840s. Back then the average travel speed was four to eight miles per hour because just like in this photo, we had horses in the 1840s, we didn't have cars. So we are retrofitting our current uh, modes of transportation into a street grid that wasn't laid out for that. So that presents some challenges as with any old town but it's a factor in making decisions. Uh, this is actually right in front of City Hall, uh, looking north, it used to be called Clay Street, is now Central Avenue at 13th Street. So we talk about comfort and things like that. Gee, what an amazing uh, storefront facade looking north up towards uh, 18th Street. And you know, comfort to people is about, do I feel comfortable myself or maybe my 12 year old kids uh, going out and using the curbside environment and the street right away to move around. Traditionally, civil engineers talked about traffic safety. We needed a statistic of an injury or an accident. To, so a lot of times civil engineers, old school thought would say, we don't have a traffic safety problem because there's no accidents. Well, my thought is I saw this happening one day driving to city hall. These are three kids. Uh, the video is more compelling in the shock of they're in the middle of crossing the street on Central and they look and this car starts to make a left turn um, on green, which it's permitted to do. But it gets challenging in our environment and rem remembering that, okay, this didn't cause an accident, so it's technically a safe maneuver because there was no statistic connect connected. Uh, this wasn't really that much of a, a, a safe experience I'm guessing for the two kids on bikes and the kid in the middle who started running across the street as the star car started to roll towards them. Uh, so before I hand it off to Marty, uh, just gonna uh, ask two questions to keep in the back of your mind as you see these, these pieces of information. So we talked about Dubuque being an older downtown. So one of the questions as we move forward as a community, uh, should we have a mobility plan that is compatible with our desired downtown land use? And then my other question is, traffic speed directly impacts uh, personal comfort. And that's a, a national uh, engineering conversation, urban planning conversation that's happening. So the question is, what is the economic development return on investment for increased traffic speed through our downtown? And these are tough questions to answer, and there's a balance to these answers, but it's factors that are, are part of the mobility discussion. With that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Steve. Well, uh, you know Ryan and Steve, you don't know me. Um, I'm Marty Schuchert. Uh, I am a principal of RDG Planning and Design. I have uh, been doing that for 34 years, and before that I was planning and community development director for the city of Omaha. And I was a rather weird uh, city employee and director because I rode a bike to work. And back then, that was so uncommon that it actually made headlines. So there were front page pa uh, articles uh, periodically in, in the Omaha World Herald uh, about at various times of my career about this odd character who had funny hair and rode a bike to work. And, uh, and, uh, but but it's, it's a way of honing one's image, at least. So, uh, it's a pleasure to be in Dubuque, uh, downtown Dubuque, uh, which we're going to talk about in, in this segment, is a really wonderful district. Um, uh, great raw material, beautiful scale and buildings and uh, architecture, and uh, one of the few funiculars in the country as well. And, um, and the projects that have been, been done uh, recently are, are, are pretty amazing. The Millwork District is a... Um, uh, I think nationally renowned example of adaptive reuse and, and, and development of a, of, a, of a really vital district. Um, the, the somewhat less ballyhooed but still very significant individual rehabs and restorations and new construction are all very impressive. And the B branch, uh, which I last saw when it was under construction, is a real knockout. I mean, it's an absolutely, absolutely incredible project. So the raw material uh, is, is, is great. And uh, mobility out of cars uh, can be a very significant contributor to the vitality of a downtown. Um, cars, when you think about it, are a really pretty ponderous way of moving, for local movements anyway, around a dense urban district. 
Um, they take a lot of space. They, uh, their, their visibility uh, and ability to see other people like uh, vulnerable users is not very good. And, um, and, and they have their place, and a, and a good downtown must accommodate automobiles, but there should be a balance, and, and pedestrian and bicycle accommodations are, 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 are very important. Um, be, we, because mobility is, is, is uh, part of the fabric that ties a downtown together, um, I thought it was interesting to, uh, to try to answer the question in a way about what a vital downtown is, what, what, a, what a living, active uh, downtown is. It's very hard to describe that without getting into platitudes. Um, so, uh, so a couple of ideas that I'd like to share with you. Um, I have a big library at home, and occasionally when I can't think of anything, I start wandering around in it and find a book that I find interesting. And uh, one of the books that I gravitate toward is this one, a book called C The City Seen as a Garden for Ideas. Um, how could you turn away from that kind of a book? And Peter Cook, who was um, a British architect of the Monty Python era, uh, the 1960s and 1970s, uh, and did uh, with his partner, who was a, uh, a friend of mine, who, I, uh, uh, who gave uh, my wife and I on our honeymoon a tour of London, uh, where, which is where we were at the time, uh, uh, identified these eight characteristics of uh, uh, this concept of a city as a garden for ideas a city of incidents where good things happen, of atmospheres, of different feelings and, and, and variety and sense of place, of paths, layers, and rooms, uh, compartmentalized areas, ways of getting at it that vary and, and, and that provide surprises, city of surprise, a city of inventions, a city of gardens uh, like Washington Park, a city of icons, uh, special places, buildings, towers, a city under the trees. So, so uh, these are, are, are interesting characteristics of a downtown. Another one that I that I love was uh, developed, um, and, and I came across this in, a, in a, a, a New York Times magazine, Sunday Magazine, a number of years ago, uh, by uh, a, a theoretical physicist who was developing equations to try to identify what good city planning was. Um, and he didn't come up with any equations, but he said something very interesting. City, good city planning increases the probability of random positive social actions while minim social interactions while minimizing distress. And that really makes a lot of sense. The ability to meet people in public spaces with positive outcomes uh, while at the same time reducing conflicts and distress is a really interesting way of describing, uh, at least from a scientific point of view, what a good downtown is. And so there are different attributes of downtown that, uh, that uh, include space for creativity, a safe environment, uh, entertainment, housing, all the usual kinds of things, but also a place that's everybody's territory, where people feel comfortable in. And mobility uh, outside of a car can be a very significant element of that. Um, so here we have an example of a city that we worked in recently, a uh, city that's a little bit smaller than Dubuque, it's Nina, Wisconsin, uh, where bicycling and pedestrian activity are so prevalent in their downtown that they get into each other's ways. So as you can see in this photograph that I took, uh, we have uh, bicycles impinging on part of the sidewalk, and in many cases, families are riding on the sidewalk, pedestrians trying to walk, and outdoor dining trying to happen as well. And, um, and these things are all pretty uh, attractive items and, and, and really build the concept of positive interaction, but not necessarily minimizing distress. So we developed a plan by which we could adapt the street strategically and tactically to be able to separate the bikes, move them off the sidewalk where they didn't belong, and, and do this all at, at the same time gaining one parking stall in the stretch of downtown that we were, we were working in. Um, there are a variety of different kinds of solutions um, uh, to, to, to consider, and we have found in, 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 in our work that ultimately the, um, the, the type of uh, facility that people feel most comfortable with is the one that separates them most effectively from motor vehicles. 
Uh, a lot of work has been done on potential user profiles, have found that only about oh, four, four to six percent of bicycle riders are what would be called highly confident. That is people who are comfortable with riding in pretty much any kind of situation. Um, I would put myself in that category, although with increasing age, that confidence level begins to drop a little bit, and your sense of mortality begins to kick in. But, um, but there, there are a very large percentage of the population that are interested in pedestrian and bicycle transportation, but don't feel comfortable with it. And those are really the target market in terms of meeting the needs that, that, that those groups um, have. So we will do, when we do bicycle plans, and we've done these from Wisconsin to Oklahoma and from uh, Wyoming to um, Indiana, most recently, um, we, we like to do a, uh, an array of uh, kind of a gallery of facilities to get some idea of what people are most comfortable with. We've done enough of these, we kind of know what the answers are. But people are comfortable in general separated facilities of various kinds that, that have some sort of physical separation. Uh, they're not necessarily comfortable with the standard bike lane, uh, although that differs depending upon the characteristics of the user. Uh, they are comfortable with quiet streets that don't have very much traffic or conflicts. And, uh, and, and sometimes things like more visible pavement markings can make a big difference as well. So this kind of uh, empirical information uh, does, uh, does help a lot. Um, bike lanes, in, in a lot of cases, are the best we can do. And they also involve some trade-offs, which we try to avoid wherever possible. But also some other mechanisms are coming. Uh, E-bikes, for example, will really uh, increase the market in a place like Dubuque. Uh, where e-bikes really level the hills out and, and, and make things that were uh, extremely, uh, 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 oh, I'd say debilitating or apprehensive to people to make those really quite, quite, quite a possibility. And so that opens up uh, an, another market. Scooters are, are, have been very popular uh, in my city, uh, maybe a little bit too popular, where we're getting a greater number of tourists and, uh, and innovations like, uh, like bike shares and, and e-bikes and, and, and the, the photograph on the lower right is, is Omaha system, which is all e-bikes now, um, work well for <laughs> short distance uh, travel from attractions to hotels to other features in a downtown district. And all of these things are beneficial because they do help to reduce the number of vehicle trips, of auto motor vehicle trips. Which, which also can reduce parking demand, uh, demand and wear and tear on streets, and, 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 and overall uh, help to contribute to a more balanced transportation picture in, um, in, um, in, in the city. Uh, so with that, I'll stop talking, and Ryan's going to introduce mobility standards. Thank you, Marty. Um, so as a result of the conversations we had from a stakeholder standpoint, um, Marty's experience uh, from a planning standpoint, our experience from a streetscape standpoint, um, we've put together a draft set of standards uh, that we've been working on with uh, city staff. Uh, these are the various elements that we are addressing. Uh, we're not uh, gonna go into details for all of these tonight, um, but you can see that a robust um, street network or civic spaces where uh, these uh, casual collisions uh, want to occur um, uh, require a number of amenities or uh, assets that create great places. So uh, first and foremost, lighting. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at is making sure that we focus on the quality of the lighting um, and, and also quantity of lighting. Uh, sometimes you might have a space that is overlit next to a space that is underlit. And the perception is, is that that underlit space actually needs to be uh, you know, brighter uh, but in fact, um, it might be just a difference in terms of the color rendering. You've probably seen lights that look bluish white. You've probably seen some that look yellow. The eye doesn't adapt. You flip on the switch in the morning and, and it's really bright and it takes a while um, for your uh, senses to uh, uh, react to that. And so uh, the picture here on the bottom left is an example of a street with a lot of glare. Uh, the picture on the right is a street example uh, where there's not as much glare. So. We're trying to think about how we can reduce glare, improve the quality of lighting, have more uniform lighting, 
uh, that benefits both the roadways, uh, the pedestrian spaces, um, potentially alleys and things like that. And I should also mention here on the top uh, is what um, our lighting designers reference in terms of the Bortle scale. And that's the amount of light that goes up. So light that goes up is actually energy going up. And so we're trying to cut back on that as we create standards by looking at having house side shield so we don't put light in the second story, focus the light where it needs to be. And so the optics and distribution is very important. Um, but Dubuque right now, uh, based on industry standards, is about a six, which is kind of uh, equivalent to a, a suburban environment on a national level. Um, so uh, certainly um, you have the opportunities to see, or see the stars at night and the moon and so forth, so it's not like Chicago. Um, but we need to keep that in mind as we establish the lighting levels and look to reduce the amount of light that is going up. Uh, secondly, um, we've, we're looking at how lighting applies to uh, the city streets. And so the city engineering department adopts SUDAS, which is the statewide urban design standard. Um, SUDAS is in the process right now of updating their standards to have more holistic uh, street um, guidance that incorporates many of the mobility elements. But looking to find ways in which we can make sure that we take real Dubuque standards, um, evaluate those, and uh, make sure that we have consistency across all the streets uh, within the city. Now, obviously, you're not going to go out and buy a bunch of new lights and put them in. But as we're working towards the future, we can learn from what we've done and, and try to uh, use this guidance here uh, to improve that uniformity. Uh, just a couple other things. When we talk about illuminance, uh, that is the measure of the light that is reflected off of a surface measured by foot candles. So when you go to a place that is really bright, a, a football field, for example, um, you're going to have potentially 50 foot candles of light measured there. You might go to a parking lot and to a, a corner, and you're going to be looking at two, maybe one. Um, so there's a really significant difference. Um, but we're trying to, f so you can see uh, some of the standards here if you wanted to dig deeper. Uh, but looking at having the average luminance across the streetscape, not so much having these hot spots or glare spots. We're trying to cut back on that. And that also impacts the perception of the space, uh, makes a warm, inviting space versus a, a really bright, lit up space. So also looking at um, standards for the pedestrian environment, um, it, you creating literally a decision-making tree. So if you're um, in a place that's used at night, do you use lighting? Yes. Um, and, and allowing design professionals, engineers, to make uh, similar decisions regardless of who is involved in a project. And again, alleyways, looking at that, and we'll come to that here in a moment. So alleys. Um, another element that makes up a vibrant downtown, you can see three examples here on the right. Most alleys are very service-oriented, and, and we see that being the predominant use of alleys. But occasionally, we have what we call joint use alleys. Uh, this is an example from Rapid City, um, one of the art alleys there that is a destination within that community that people travel to. Um, and then lastly is what we're calling a destination alley, uh, which is shown here in the bottom right. Um, and that is really where the shift goes from being vehicular dominated to pedestrian dominated. These standards, these standards that we're working through here aren't telling you where these go, but if somebody or the community has an idea and you want to evaluate that, this would be the guidance that you could refer to. Um, a couple things here just to point out. Uh, the joint use is kind of when we begin to think about adding some lighting for safety um, or also ADA compliant pavement surfaces. So those are things that have to be worked through um, if you're moving from one spot to the other. And of course, destination. Um, one of the things to point out there is uh, public alleys, you know, we want to maintain uh, access for EMS vehicles, fire, and so forth. So full-on closure of alleys is not necessarily a good thing in our eyes, but adapting the alley to Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, entertainment, cafe seating is something that we think would be uh, very welcome. Emergency phones, you've likely seen some of these in the community. Um, establishing some standards for that, um, you know, some, some if the Things to consider as you're um, putting these out, um, you know, is there cell service? Uh, is it a public park? Um, do you have a documented history of crime? Are you further away from uh, three blocks away from another one? And, and just being mindful of um, also the potential for uh, the message that might send the wrong message. And we want to be uh, mindful of that. And also maintenance and the cost of them. Um, they're not insignificant uh, to put in. Signage and wayfinding. 
um, looking at uh, the manual and uniform traffic control, which is what uh, governs state highways, city streets. It's what's been adopted by the community here. Um, and, and creating a template, not necessarily designs. We're not creating a new signage and wayfinding system here. But if one was to be created, you would have the guidance you need to follow the best practices uh, to create a master plan. And so this is uh, an example of that. Uh, sidewalks, uh, creating standards for those, uh, showing a preference for what we call continental sidewalks, which really stand out much more so than just two parallel bars. Um, being mindful of the image Steve had shown there of the three uh, children going through the sidewalk. Um, and then also, as projects come forward and there's a development taking place and it needs to go all the way to the street, we would suggest that you, know, uh, you make uh, the effort to try to have a pedestrian detour to go around that so that folks don't have to go across the street, go back around. Um, of course, obviously, these need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, but as a, a best practice, those are things that we're suggesting. Bike share, come up already tonight. Um, one of the things that we believe, uh, if uh, both scooters and bikes um, are being contemplated, um, number one, scooters belong in bike lanes uh, not net or shared use paths. Um, they could be on the street as well, but um, they go over much better when they are in a bike lane. Uh, we would suggest that we prohibit scooters from being on sidewalks. Um, we've just recently, my family got back from Seattle and um, they, they have a dock list system there, so they're scattered everywhere. Uh, it, it, while it's fun, it's, it's also uh, kind of a challenging uh, uh, operation and, and maintenance, and, and I would question whether or not visually it's the right visual you want. So we believe a docked system which helps manage where scooters go from district to district would be uh, the best route forward. And then also education is a key, compart a key component of that. Marty already touched on shared use paths, so I'm going to uh, go past that one, but Marty, if you want to touch base here in a few minutes or just summarize our, our kind of uh, standards for bike lanes, um, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, um, well, bike lanes are the most common form of of, uh, of bicycle and and I would say mobility infrastructure. So they they really, as Ryan said, work well for scooters, and that's really where they where they, where they belong. Um, when bike lanes are instituted, we generally look for places where they can be done with minimum impact. Uh, that is, not displacing parking, if at all possible, not impeding traffic flow. Um, we bicyclists know that we're not necessarily the high people on the totem pole in the United States, as much as, as, as nice as that might be. Uh, but. Um, but uh, we have a place, but the place should not be at the cost of other, uh, at, uh, of other priorities. So, um, so we, we look for contexts where, 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 where bicycle and mobility facilities can be, can be fitted in that are appropriate. Those are, those are kind of the first things to be, uh, to be looking at. Um, we, we feel as well that uh, we, we need to understand that uh, motor vehicles take a certain amount of space, so recommend for the most part 11 foot minimum tra uh, vehicle lane widths, um, and, and really strongly recommend, particularly with standard bike lanes, doing things like using green paint strategically to increase visibility. Uh, so this is an example of a, of, a, of, a, of a bike lane that was implemented based on a plan that we did for uh, North Avenue in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. And the fact that there are patches of green under the, the, the bike lane symbol really do help identify those uh, a, a lot better. Uh, so these produce what we call enhanced uh, bike lanes uh, that are uh, more visible and more comfortable for, for people and also more visible to uh, motor vehicle drivers as well, which tend to have the influence of slowing traffic down, which is also, uh, which is also a good thing. Um, when we look at a community, uh, we look at different contexts, look at uh, the, the widths uh, of streets and the, the, the layout, and so have identified here in the standards a number of different generic uh, contexts be matched with different street sections in uh, downtown Dubuque and surrounding areas. So for example, here is a case of, of uh, a paired situation where there would be a bike lane in one direction on one street and in the opposite direction on a parallel street. So it's basically reducing the amount of space necessary in that, in that street. 
uh, more conventional setting of, um, of, a, of a double sided parking with, um, with bike lanes and uh, information in the final report that, sh that shows the space requirement in each of these individual um, types of facilities. Here, uh, looking at a buffered bike lane or, 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 or uh, a cycle track as well that involves some sort of physical separation but still using uh, the street channel to accommodate the, the, the facility. So uh, an entire menagerie of different kinds of facilities that can be fitted with different, um, uh, with different street contexts in, in, in Dubuque and in cities like Dubuque uh, that help to produce what, what can eventually be an implementation plan. So next steps. Whoever's doing that. So that really concludes the bulk of our presentation tonight. Next steps would be to get some feedback. Again, we uh, had an hour to work with tonight approximately. Uh, so being a good engineer, I could talk for four hours on design standards if anybody would prefer a follow-up session later. But uh, we need to reach out. Obviously, there's a lot here to unpack. It's a little bit way, uh, different way of thinking about downtown and moving about downtown. So we need to reach back out with some of the content we've developed primarily with our internal uh, departments that they think identifying uh, open-ended questions, uh, evolving change of practices, e-scooters is certainly, you know, uh, happening in other communities. I'm sure I've seen a few people driving around already in Dubuque with their own personal one. And uh, so things like that are, are coming. Uh, talking about uh, connecting downtown destinations plan. So that project is funded in the current fiscal year. So we're working on a contractual amendment with uh, Walker Parking and RDG as the lead on that piece. So that'll be kind of uh, supplementing uh, basically how to get to connect to destinations. Schmidt Island, B Branch Greenway, uh, Comiskey Park, Lower Main Street, Port of Dubuque, all the fun places that people like to go as they uh, come and go between and not always uh, prefer to maybe, because uh, they're out enjoying themselves, uh, drive a car to get there. And then we'll integrate. So the SUDAS design standards, again, at, at some point, uh, I'm not a licensed professional engineer, but when we put out a road project, a professional engineer has to put their seal uh, of approval on those uh, plans and specifications. They need to follow design standards. And when they don't, there are things called waivers to design standards, but there needs to be a, a logic to a application of engineering judgment is the phrase we use in, in the industry. So seeing what SUDAS comes out with in some of the things we talked about tonight over the next six months, we'll have to digest that as an engineering staff and again, see how it fits into what we're talking about. And then just working towards eventual action or implementation plan. So, Really our goal tonight was to uh, provide work in progress uh, update to you all and uh, if you'd like to tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, what you'd like to see us dive into more, that's what uh, the three of us would be happy to take questions from you. Mm -hmm. With that, I'll turn it back over. Well, excellent. Well, thank you all, um, Steve, Ryan, Marty. It was, uh, this is an excellent and very thought-provoking conversation, so thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we have plenty of time for discussion, so let's have it. I thought Mr. Resnick would have something to ask about on this one, so go for it, Mr. Resnick. Well, thank you, and I have quite a few different things, but let me just shoot my wad here, and then you can react to whatever you'd like to hear. I'm just going to write a few things, uh, tell you a few things that I wrote. Um, first of all, when I was younger, of course, it was bike places or don't go, right? But now, the most people get are older, they have to enjoy the ride. And so I appreciated that we make these bike uh, trails uh, and bike paths enjoyable. And then so you take it for fun and then it's like, oh, I could get over here. I don't need to take the car to go to so-and-so. I, you know, so uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate the uh, idea that uh, uh, e-bikes are a big deal because when I was in college and I worked at a bank, I love to go to work and bike to work, but when I get there, you know, you continue to sweat for half an hour <laughs> after you get into this air conditioned. And, and I was in no condition to meet with customers if I was going to bike, which was very disappointing to me, especially because I had to bike sometimes. And uh, But anyway, so I appreciate that. Um, some of the things about safety here in Dubuque, and that is uh, when I'm going downtown, there's no place to ride your bike, and so they're riding all over the place. They're, bikes are shooting around everywhere. 
uh, they don't know where to bike or they don't know how they're biking. Um, and so I was going to recommend that as far as safety is that uh, if they get a one hour, if people get a one hour safety class, if the city could sponsor, you know, for the, or the bike coop, you know, if they get a one hour safety class, then they could get a free uh, safety light, a little button to put on the back of their, their bike and maybe a license. Um, we don't do that anymore. When I was a kid, there was an actual little license that we put on our, our, and I was very proud of that. I made a lot of noise. It was fun. Uh, and because you, uh, a quote was education is a key component and and that's what our bikers don't really know where to go or what to do you know even those simple bicycle rules to be considered to all the drivers um, and so they're biking in an uh, erratic manner I noticed that um, when I saw that bike lane um, I automatically think of car doors opening at any moment and I'm gonna smash right into one I know so many bikers and people who will bike, um, I, I hear one catastrophic story after another. You know, they're biking and all of a sudden this happens. Mm, because, you know, so I can see why people are a little bit uh, uh, reticent to go biking uh, when they're gonna, it's gonna be a, a big physical challenge and, uh, you know, it's dangerous. People don't expect them to be biking. Um, and I notice also that you had a nice separated bike path on a one-way. And I think one-ways are better for a bike path because everybody's going one way. So you gotta have extra space when you get this two-way. But of course, we're looking at changing our one-ways to two-way. So then we have to figure out what we want to do for that. Or do we want to you know, change our one-ways to two-way? There's a lot of good reasons both ways. Um, so those are the things I was uh, thinking about. Uh, Making, making it a safer place in Dubuque, making it a sh uh, an easier bike route to, to get to, you know, a way to get through town. And I know you're thinking about that, uh, thinking about whether we want to go to uh, two ways when uh, one way you can get a separated bike path. I think more, I think more and more people will want to bike, especially now that we have those e-bikes that make that east-west trip a lot better and say, hey, you know, here's the bike path. They, you know, I love the when going up Dodge Street and you could have that bike. But I mean, I guess I, I feel bad when I'm in the street because I feel vulnerable, but I feel bad when I'm on the sidewalk because, you know, people are walking and I have to get off and, 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 and which is the right thing to do. It's just a tricky place right now. So if we have some dedicated uh, bike lanes, which would be great, that's of course, bikes for bikes and I think that would be really helpful and, that, and if you could make that a part of the mix mm -hmm. voila so if you would like to react to any of that I'd appreciate it sure. thank you if I, I'll, I'll, uh, and throw out one thought and we'll turn it over to Marty so uh, before I arrived at the city of Dubuque I worked for the Connecticut uh, Department of Transportation for 11 years design, doing a roadway design work and one of the things I was taught is how to avoid accidents from a driving perspective is what we call driver expectancy. In other words, accidents occur when somebody makes a movement in another vehicle and the, the first driver didn't expect that movement to happen. And I think if you th apply that thought process to bike lanes, if I'm a, even if I'm driving a car, but I see a bike lane, I'm expecting to see bicyclists. If I'm parking next to a bike lane, I'm expecting hopefully to start to think about, hey, when I open my car door, there's probably, there might be a bike in the bike lane, surprisingly. So some of that feeds into, and we've talked about this at a staff level, as we get ready to roll this plan out more, just multimodal access. Uh, yeah, just a public, good public conversation, uh, engagement about, hey, when do you need to stop at a crosswalk as a vehicle? If I'm in a bike lane and I come to a stop and there's a crosswalk in front of me, do I have to still have to yield the car? So we do plan to probably wait for better weather in the spring, but uh, public education will definitely be a piece of this, uh, one of the outcomes moving forward. Marty? Um, yeah, I, I, Mr. Resnick, I appreciate the comments. I could not agree with you more on the issue of bicycle education and, and bicycle use education. And I am one of uh, what are called LCIs, League Certified Instructors. So it's a, a training program of, of bike ed instructors 
that uh, we go through like a three-day program, take a test that indicates that we somewhat learn something, and then uh, have a, uh, effectively a certification that says we're qualified to, uh, to teach groups or people how to um, ride bikes safely. That's very important, and you're right. There are tons of riders, in fact, the, the vast majority who have no idea what they're doing and are, as a result, putting themselves in unsafe situations and, and in many cases are being unpredictable. Uh, I've seen many cases where a motorist will assume that I'm going to go through a red light or go through a stop sign. And so they, they yield, which in a way creates an ambiguous and sometimes potentially hazardous situation. Or, or, that, uh, or that stop and let it's sort of death, we we'll call it death by the Good Samaritan, where, where, where uh, a car in one direction will stop, even though they shouldn't, to let you go through, and you'll wind up getting hit by the car in the other direction that isn't, that, that, that isn't stopping. So, th so the idea of that kind of predictability and knowledge is very important, and, and it's very much an element of a, good, of a good alternative transportation program to incorporate that in, 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 the, in the programs. Um, the, um, so so, so I, think, I think that's important, and it cuts both ways. So there was a, a, a time when I rarely get speeding tickets, but I got one. <laughs> went to, instead of getting points on my license, went to uh, the uh, instruction, remedial instruction, and sort of hijacked the class and did a half hour on how drivers should behave and expect of bicyclists. So, uh, so, so adding that kind of a component that deals with pedestrian and bicycle safety in remedial driver's classes where they tend to gravitate toward the most aggressive drivers, uh, well, not necessarily, the ones who get caught anyway, well, is, 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 is really a good idea. And, and then finally, um, yeah, you're right, that trying to look at the context of a street and, and pick out the best solution that we can accommodate that gets people where they need to be or where they want to be comfortably, safely, and with a, with a good experience um, is, is, is really the proof of the pudding. So, so I appreciate those comments. Great, That's and thank exactly you for your right. comments, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ms. Farber, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to um, thank you, Marty, for your um, Bring Downtown to Life um, presentation that you gave us. And, and I would like to expand that to bring the city to life. And perhaps when you are talking about um, educating the public on biking, just as um, Mr. Resnick had said, what about taking that to the schools? Because, um, you know, very much so if you start young riding a bike, then you're going to want to do it as you progress um, in your life, if you will. Uh, and I think that I remember I always biked to, uh, to, to school. Um, and I biked everywhere. And I you know, enjoyed the exercise at the time, but there's less traffic perhaps at that time than there is now, and it's perhaps less dangerous. But wouldn't it be quite interesting to um, do that kind of education to the schools Absolutely. and yeah. then provide bike paths and um, alleyways or some kind of um, modal um, access for those yeah. kids going to those schools, and at what age do you recommend yeah. that you do that training? Absolutely. Uh, it, it, it is something that ought to be in, in schools and even in physical education curricula. And uh, there are, uh, for people who can't afford bikes, uh, there are many cities, I don't know if Dubuque has one, that, that have bike rehabilitation programs where where people with surplus bikes donate them and they can be fixed, so forth and so on. There's a very important and, and specialized thing about, about bike education for kids, though, and that is that they do not perceive the world in the same way that adults do. Um, it's, the scale is different, the visibility is different, and, and uh, there are a lot of lives to be saved by programs that are specifically designed for, for, for children. And, and the League, the League of American Bicyclists has those, and those are things that, that an instruction program should, um, sh should, should really accommodate. Right. And, so and, yeah, very good point. And another uh, important point, I think, is for the high schoolers, because those are the ones that all of a sudden are riding the cars to school. Oh. And is there a way to um, educate and to kind of reshape thoughts about bicycling and exercise and things like that? So. Thank you very much. Ms. Wethel. 
Well, I um, do want to just circle back to Ms. Farber's comment. Um, I was riding bicycles with my family downtown on our way to Schmidt Island to try and connect with a trail. And we had, um, I'll just say an incident with drivers not really being friendly to us on a roadway. And my children, when we pulled over said, don't they know we're in the right place because the person had yelled, get on the sidewalk. And my daughter said, no, I learned in school, that's not where I'm supposed to be. And so there's some sort of a curriculum I know that in our school system we're working with, but I think it's a great point that, um, yeah, start early with that conversation. My main question relates to crosswalks actually. Uh, related to our Central Avenue development, some of the folks who are down on Central Avenue, including those um, who are related to the voices, um, uh, very much bringing in artists to our community to do mural work, they questioned whether we could create crosswalks that were mural work. And um, they had showed us some examples of that. And I didn't know, is there a legal structure around what a crosswalk must look like? Because that made me really excited but I wasn't sure where we could go from there. Yes, so currently, uh, Ryan, I believe mentioned the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which is a federal manual uh, that gets updated every eight to 10 years. Uh, doesn't really allow for that. I know we see them all over the country. The Iowa Department of Transportation has taken a conservative approach in the past about crosswalks need to look like crosswalks and street murals belong not in the street. Two things. Uh, there has been a major, over the past 18 months, update in progress on the manual on uniform traffic control devices. And if I had to bet a dollar tonight, the next manual uh, release, which could be coming out in months, uh, is going to allow for a lot of that. There is a lot of strong advocacy, as with any federal uh, legislation and input uh, about murals. Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg um, has done a study on the calming effects of murals and, and how uh, traffic calming. So part of that is a legal side. I think the SUDAS updates will, I hope, speak to that. I know people have been asking for that because again, as engineers, uh, event, at some point, there's, there's a responsibility as a professional engineer to, to follow the standards. So when we don't follow the standards, there's a, a big step an engineer has to take on liability just in terms of making sure everybody's safe, anticipating how things might be used. So, uh, but I think those standards are about to change and uh, I think we will be seeing that. And I'll let Ryan and Marty speak to the actual application and use of. Yeah, just a couple additional things to add. I, I would say that, um, you know, the Bloomberg study does indicate that they do have a traffic calming effect. Uh, some of the other research would suggest that sometimes, depending on the mural, it might make it more difficult to see the pedestrian, depending on the lighting conditions. And so um, I would say that um, there's very much an active conversation within the professional societies around this, and I think um, we're excited to see what uh, SUDAS comes out with if they address it or the manual and uniform traffic control. Um, it sounds like I'm kind of punting on the on the response on a yes or a no, but um, it, it it's something that is you know that happening right now that discussion and and I don't know if we know enough yet to to make a, an informed judgment, especially when there's health, safety, welfare implications. So. We love art and appreciate it a lot, um, but would really like to fully understand, you know, the nuances as to what they find after that uh, comes out. Sure. I did appreciate the um, continental sidewalks. Don't know that term until tonight, but I thought when I see those, it's a dramatic change in what I appear um, to need to slow down for versus the lines that you described, it really is a difference. So I think I can appreciate that what a crosswalk looks like is just as important as how we place it. I do think there's a dramatic need for crosswalks in downtown and for us to really look at that all over again, because I think it really does limit us in the ability to cross major roadways. Specifically, I know Central is a major one, um, but others as well. And of all the areas of town where we want people to be able to walk and have livable space outdoors, I, I just, yes, I'm, in, I'm very intrigued with bike paths. I think it's an important piece too, but I do think crosswalks is a major piece of what we need to look at. Yeah, I, I, have, I have very strong feelings about crosswalks. Uh, that the, the 
traditional transfers. There, there are people who say crosswalks shouldn't be in place because they give pedestrians a false sense of security, which I think is nonsense. Mm -hmm. The, the transverse sidewalks are not very visible. The continental ones are really, really far better and, and, and really make a much bigger difference. Uh, in some places that have really heavy uh, pedestrian loads, and I, my, my kids live in LA, so, so these are places where they, they really use very big stripes and very relatively wide uh, sidewalks and they're, they're quite visible. And some of the places in the LA area, and I don't know if this will be in the manual or not, use yellow instead of white. Uh, I think the jury's out on visibility, but, 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 but what we call high visibility crosswalks, especially in places that are going to attract a lot of pedestrians and that involve potential hazards like crossing an arterial street, like a, like a Central Avenue, really are, really are important and, and make, a, make a very big difference. Thank you. Ms. Roussel. Thank you. I'll, I just want to share um, uh, something that I really liked about your presentation. And, and that is the breadth of the issues that you're looking at. And so in one point, it, you mentioned that there were a high percentage of respondents in the over $100,000 per year category. And those people have a lot more flexibility, different needs, different um, requests. And then on the other hand, you have the people who are in poverty who, for whom a transportation is a barrier to their daily life. And having these alternative forms of mobility can really transform their opportunities. So I think by looking at the breadth of those, I think we're really gonna have a much better result. So I really thank you for looking at the entire spectrum and our community will have a, a great plan in the end. So thank you. Yeah. Sprint, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for all that information. That was a lot of good information and to kind of piggyback off with Ms. Wethel, definitely I'd like to see something with crosswalks. I think they just, I, it gives a sense of neighborhood a connection. Uh, can be place setting, however, or place marking. But I just, I think it'd be fun to see something. But I understand we have to deal with what the DOT and the feds and everybody says. So but hopefully that changes. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Jones, I know you're out there. Do you have anything to add? Is he out there? That we know of? Yeah? All right. I'm going to guess no. So I'll jump in and then we'll, we'll wrap us up here. So, um, Thank you again for this. this I, I really appreciate this discussion. So I want to I want to point something out. I'm going to say Apologies, this. Brad. I was out here and no. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Um, I'm going to say this. I, I don't mean to be too blunt, but I want to make sure that I make a point. Um, I, I've had the the great opportunity to travel a lot in the last couple of years, and um, one of my favorite things to do when I get to any new place is to find a bike share or a scooter to be able to see the world on two wheels. I just absolutely think it's the best way to discover a new, a new city and be able to get around. We are way behind. We're way behind on this. And I mean, it's just, we just, we're, we're doing okay in talking about it, but um, when we go to other places and especially in Iowa, you know, I mean, in just a, for example, the last two Iowa League of Cities conferences have been in Waterloo last year and Cedar Rapids just a couple of weeks ago. Um, dedicated bike lanes, places for people to go, clear um, sense of how you get around in certain places. Now I know that everybody dresses themselves up a little bit better when the Iowa League of Cities comes to town, but that said, I think from a standard of, and, and Steve, I really appreciated what you pointed out with the, the pictures, the, the captures that you had from the video cameras in those different situations. That was extremely helpful to be able to see that and think about this in a different way. Um, you know, for me personally, I, since I did get an e-bike, my, my world of transportation has changed completely. I have yet to meet a hill that I can't conquer in the city of Dubuque, which is definitely a different story. But, um, and I'm not nearly as sweaty as what I, what I was in the past, as Mr. Resnick mentioned. But more than anything though, the ability to be able to get around and do it safely and, and, and see it in a way where you can get to the places you need to go, we just don't have an easy sense for any sort of pedestrian or bicycle or scooter rider or anybody like that of where you get around and how you get around. I've found myself in downtown Dubuque every once in a while taking alleyways instead of taking roads because it feels safer at the moment if, there's a, if it's busy traffic and things that are going on. Um, but you're going through alleyways, you're shooting out into streets every single block and that's not exactly safe either. 
So what, what I would hope we can get from, from this and this discussion and start to think about, you know, as a council and as a policymaking body, but then also as a city staff is, is just this general idea that if we, if we truly want to have um, a vibrant downtown, that we need widespread and functional mobility in all of its forms in downtown. But then moving outside of the downtown area, you know, you think about the east-west corridor and places like that, we have so much room for pedestrians and we just aren't using it. We're giving it all to cars. We've been doing that for a long time. And I think that the fixes are, uh, might be a little bit simpler than we like to realize. So what I hope we don't get into is too much analysis paralysis with this, where we just stop ourselves from doing anything, because that would be the absolute worst thing that we can do. I, I think what we, we really have a lot of options here. You know, I mean, think about Fremont, for example. Fremont is like four cars wide. You know, there's, if you want to get on Fremont with a bike, you, it's pretty easy to ride, but there's plenty of room to be able to, to mark, you know, places for more pedestrians and, and other um, places for bikes. And then when it comes to crosswalks, I completely agree with the discussion we had here. Um, and then sidewalks. We haven't mentioned sidewalks in our part of this discussion, but we've talked about sidewalks a lot at this desk, and I think it's important that we continue to move forward on putting sidewalks in places where there aren't any so that people can get around the way they need to. Um, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very excited to see this discussion moving in the direction that it is, the pictures that you're starting to show us of ways that we can uh, start to accomplish this as a city. But what I, what I hope we do is that we just start to do it. I, I hope we start to move forward. I know it hasn't risen to the level of being a priority for us as a council over the last couple of years. Um, I'm hopeful that we start to get there in the next couple of years. I know we've, you know, I, I agree with our focus right now on the, the foundational aspects of what we need to do, but I think that some of these amenities are things that are really a next step that will take us and vault us into that next tier of where other cities are so that we can start to have people get around better and um, both people who live here and people who are visiting because we have a lot of those too. So thank you for everything that you've given us tonight and um, we really appreciate the, the discussion and the direction that this is going. Um, I think we've, we've had a, some nice additions here from the council as well. So thanks again for the time and yeah, appreciate it. And there being no further business in the work session, we will be adjourned for a few minutes.